Welcome to Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday. We're going to get into another video on defining a Christian. I look forward to jumping back into especially the Riggs translation of John chapter 17, starting in verse 20. But before we do, we do these videos, number one, so that you can become more aware of God. I say this a lot, but really everything about our walk with God comes down to awareness and recognition. Awareness, recognition of spiritual things, of God himself. It's wonderful to have the truth of God's word. We're always preaching the truth of God's word. But remember, everything about the Bible and what we have recorded is for us to grow in our relationship in such a way that God is as real to us as he was to those yesterday, as he was to Jesus. This is extremely possible. That's the reason why defining a Christian is about being Christ-like. So, uh, as we talk about this, number one, uh, that we would experience God. Number two, that we would begin to use our faith effectively and get answers to prayers. And number three, that we would share those testimonies with others. Now, we always start out with a passage of scripture that's really good. It's over in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27 to 30 in the Message Bible. And this is the passage for Adventures in Grace videos. Now, Jesus resumed talking, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father and son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the Son the way the Father does, nor the Father the way the Son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Great passage of Scripture. Uh, Jesus wanted us to know the Father, excuse me, wanted us to know the Father in the same way that he himself understood, knew, was aware, recognized the Father, and worked with him so incredibly well. So here we come back into being a follower of Christ, which then puts, if you will, the focus on how did Jesus do life as he did, because that's actually how we then should see ourselves. And of course, there's some more things to it. And, you know, we, we went over, I have a hard time leaving John chapter 10, verse 30 through the end of the chapter, but we're actually gonna come back to that in a little bit, so I'm, I'm gonna be okay doing it, because there's some really amazing thoughts there about what are we as human beings? I mean, how did God actually make us and fashion us so that we can think a whole lot different than just as what the world would think concerning a human being, which is the elevation of the mind, the elevation of the senses, operating out of that which you know from the past to dictate that which you're going to experience in your future. But oh, thank God, once you begin to step into the shoes of Jesus Christ by being born again, all of a sudden, we begin to take on a whole new plethora, if you will, of experiences because now we're touching and experiencing the spiritual world. So again, I'm just going to read this, but then we're going to go on, okay? I know I'm going to get back to some of these things, but I love this. John 17, 27 to, uh, 20 to 27 in the Riggs translation. Such is my prayer for these beloved disciples. But my heart's desire reaches out beyond them to all believers in all times and places who shall by means of their preaching come to faith in me. May they all, O oh Father, be one. I like that so much because I try to stay simple, simple in my approach. I know there's some thoughts I have that are deep, but they're still simple. <clears throat> and God 
wants us to experience him as one, as though we are united together with him, joined in union with Christ. And this is what this is saying. And Jesus prays, O Father, that we would be one. Let nothing imperil the unity of those who accept me as their Savior. As you are in me and I am in you, one in spirit and life, may they be one in us, that in order that by such a spiritual unity, the world may be compelled to believe in the divine origin of my mission. I have given them what you have given me, the glory of revealing the divine and human life, of knowing and showing forth the Father's love, in order that they, as we, may live in and for each other, I in them, and you in me, that in this absolute harmony of life, a complete and final unity may be attained. The result will be that the world shall come to know through evidence which cannot be gainsaid or that cannot be denied that my church is from you and that the church is the church of God. Wow, such a wonderful, wonderful passage of scripture. And I'm gonna read a couple of thoughts here from John G. Lake. He's, he can stimulate my mind very well with the way that he thinks. He thinks very um, uh, scientific, if you will. Listen to what he said about Christianity. It is the indwelling presence of Almighty God within your spirit, soul, and body. God living, breathing in your life, filling your spirit and your mind and your body until there is no longer a trace of the world's sin, sickness, failure, or concern. Christianity is the living triumph of Jesus possessing your heart and mind until you are a divine expression of Christ's victory. That's so meaty and so good. It's the indwelling of two that have now become one and your thoughts are his thoughts and his thoughts are your thoughts and your vision is his and his is yours and you no longer think like you. You think like him. You talk like him. You walk like him. You perform or you manifest the power of God just like him. But it comes in that union. Notice what else he said. It is the conscious presence of the living, risen Son of God dwelling in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which causes you and I to know that the power of God is equal to every emergency and is great enough for the deliverance of every soul from every oppression. What is it again? The conscious presence of the living, risen Son of God dwelling in your heart by the Holy Ghost. What is that? Awareness. What is that? Recognition. God becoming so real to you. God being so big within you. The feelings, the emotions, the tangibility of God in your life. And that translates into what? Having such a consciousness of victory before you even start. That people are healed. That you are well. That you walk in victory because you're already on the other side in Christ. Another one is really good. The triumph of Christ is the triumph of what you know in your soul. That's the word consciousness. Consciousness is not about what you're praying for, what you're believing for, what you're hoping for. Consciousness is the thing that you know, okay? We have a saying here in our modern day, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. That's consciousness. You've already experienced it. It's the thing that you know. It's the thing that you can go back to because it's real to you. I remember one time Brother Hagen uh, was called up by his uh, sister, Olita, and it was concerning her daughter who just had a baby and, and part of the head was kind of not filled out like it should be and it was deformed. And she called up and she said, Ken, we need you to pray. And Brother Hagen said, well, the baby's going to be fine. And she said, did um, Jesus appear to you? And he said, no. Did an angel appear to you? No. Did you uh, hear God say that to you? No. Well, what would make you say that? He said, Mark eleven twenty three. You can have what you say. Speak to the mountain. Be thou removed. Be thou cast in the sea. Doubt not in your heart. Believe that those things which you say will come to pass. You'll have whatever you say. Well, let me just say this. That wasn't his first merry-go-round. You see, he'd already had a vision, already had a revelation, already had used that. 
He had a consciousness of his words with his family bringing those results. And he said it. That's what it says here. The triumph of Christ is the triumph of what you know in your own soul. The victory of the Christ and the victory of the soul is in the knowledge of the relationship between your soul and the soul of Christ. The victory <coughs> of the Christ and the victory of a soul has to do with the merging together of your soul and Christ. Well, what I've just given you is exactly what that prayer was. No different whatsoever. That was the prayer. The oneness is what is the victory. The union is what is the consciousness. So you're not praying to get something. You already own that something. You're already there. You know, I'm speaking from experience as I'm talking about these things. I'm excited about, and it's not as though I'm not there, but I'm excited about becoming even more aware of that place. Back in the day, and in one sense, there wasn't anything special about that day versus our day today. But I was preaching 500 to 550 times a year. Now, I don't know what I'm doing now with all the videos and all the things that we do. It's got to be somewhat in, in, in some high numbers. But we were doing so much with prayer school and healing school that eventually you get into a place where you operate and it's scary because you think, I didn't hear him say to do this. I didn't um, see this. It's like I own this. And then you step out and you say and you do, and it works. And then after it works, you sit back and think, Lord, was that me or was that you? Or was that me and you, you and me? But it sure felt like me. And then all of a sudden you have to wrestle. And I did for some time. And there was a time where I, I backed off a little bit because I was a little bit too afraid that it was me. One of my friends said to me, uh, Jim, this is who you are. Don't step back. Go even further. And then it took me a couple of weeks to get back into that because for a couple of weeks I backed off. And, and the devil will work on your brain if you back off. He'll work on your brain when you're getting there to try to keep you from seeing how, how together you and God really are fused as one vessel. It's what Jesus was praying about. It's hard for me to get off of this because it's so, so important and vital to the steps that we take that have success attached to it versus mimicking someone else or intellectually speaking to your mountain or taking a step of faith, but the heart's not connected. And everything is about the heart being connected. Well, let's go, let's go uh, keep going here. Matthew chapter 10, one through nine. And it says here, and when he, Jesus, had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out. Now, notice here, I'm not going to nitpick. Oh, kind of nitpicking. Yeah, I am a, a little bit nitpicking. But I'm going to try not to over nitpick. <laughs> How's that? He gave them power. Notice he didn't clarify that. The power I'm giving you is not all the power that there is. There are gifts of the Spirit. And so, therefore, you're going to need these gifts of the Spirit to work in conjunction with the power that I'm giving you. Jesus is smarter than that. He knows how the human mind and psyche goes. It'd be better to say what I'm giving you is what I actually use. And guys, have you seen me use it pretty well? I mean, we're 100% for 100% with those that are open enough to receive it. If somebody says, I don't want it, well, that's a different story. Jesus in his own hometown, Mark chapter 6. 
But he was smart enough to give them power and impress upon them that they had what was necessary to get the job done. You say, well, what, what is that? Look, oh, look, 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 look. He said, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Notice here, it doesn't say all unclean spirits. So this passage alone might make you think, hmm, I can get rid of all sickness and all disease, but you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it's possible we can't get every devil out. Well, then you would have to go to Luke and find that in Luke chapter 9, I don't have that written here, he says that when he gives them all power, he says, I give you all, I give you power over all unclean spirits and to heal sickness and disease. There, he didn't say all sickness and disease. He said all unclean spirits. So you've got two writers here that if you put them together, what they're hearing is Jesus said, I give you power over all unclean spirits, over all sickness and all disease. Now, what part of all does it mean all? <laughs> I mean, we've really got to just simplify this and begin to allow God to build within us an awareness and consciousness of how Jesus thinks. It goes on to say, now the names of the 12, and he goes on to tell the names of the 12, and then coming down into verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, do not go into, into the way of the Gentiles, do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received freely give. Now, isn't it interesting when Jesus says, and he begins to now give specifics, he said, heal the sick. That's all the sick. But then he also said, cleanse the lepers. Then he also said, raise the dead. Then he also said, cast out the demons. And how did he clarify this? Well, you know, if you're going to raise the dead, you're going to have to have at least three gifts of the spirit manifestation. Amen. If you're going to cleanse the leper, you're going to have to have a couple of gifts of the Spirit manifestation, at least gifts of healing and working of miracles, at least. Because you get them healed of the leprosy, but then you're going to have to have a miracle to put that nose back on. See, we've become so educated and so smart. We've smarty pantsed ourselves right out of being so simple to believe that we have what's necessary to get the job done. Now, I may have offended somebody by saying we smarty pantsed ourselves right out of what is simple. But I'm trying to show you here, Jesus did not give the revelation of the gifts of the Spirit. I don't marginalize those. I don't minimize those. I don't disrespect those. I want to walk in everything God has for me. But the way to do that is to walk in the power that has been given to us. And that power that's been given to us seems in this passage to be such that we can walk forward, move toward the obstacle, and know that we have what it takes to move the obstacle. And it's in that knowing and consciousness that the Holy Spirit will manifest gifts if necessary, but you don't even have to know that it is one. You're just moving forward with the power that he's given you. And how did he say he gave it to you? Freely. And how did he say you're supposed to give it? Freely. Mm. We're stepping into some things about defining a Christian. And my time's gone, so I'll read this. This is really good. It says, I have more praise reports. On my friend's knee, he and his PT, that's physical therapist, person thinks he has a meniscus problem. It's been going on for weeks. He came over to help me on the property. I told him when, when we get done with photogra uh, photographing my inventory, I would like to lay hands on his knees. He said, yes. He sat in a chair and asked, what do I need to do? I said, do you, do you want to be healed? He said, yes. I told him to claim the healing, receive it, and call it done in Jesus' name. I placed my hands on his left knee and spoke over him, inviting the Holy Spirit to come. I felt heat in about 30 seconds and told him, it's healing. Do you feel the heat? He was quiet. I spoke in tongues 
actually whispered. And then, uh, then said, it's done. Do you receive this healing? Yes, he said. My friend is tenderhearted towards Jesus. He just found, out, found his faith. We walked in, uh, outside to his car and he said, he called my name. He said, it's better. It's really better. I told him to keep claiming and receiving the healing. The next day he texted me. This is what he said. I prayed last night for the first time forever. I asked Jesus to help me find my way back to him. I was bawling. I recorded a prayer for him using some of the words from Charles Capp's uh, God's Creative Power book. He just now texts me that his knee is good and he listens to my recording a lot. Hallelujah. I'm bawling my head off, she said. I'm going to start a journal. This is number four since our last gathering in Castle Rock. That's one of the individuals that's helping us and being taught to become very proficient at helping others with the healing center, healing by design. Isn't that just wonderful what Jesus does? You make yourself available and don't disqualify yourself when he's qualified all of us. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, thanks for being with us. Go to jhmi at jimhockaday.com. You'll find it on our website, jimhockaday.com. It's our email, and email us stories just like this. If you're following us, then you've got grace stories just like this one. Can't wait to see you next time. Jump back into this. Have a good night.